Breaking it all down, I'm Count Zero. Now, last week I said that this episode would be a review of the classic Arthur C. Clarke novel, Rendezvous with Rama. Well, in the words of the late, great Eddie Guerrero, I lied! Now, just, I actually did kind of lie a bit, because at the time I recorded that review, I had already pre-ordered tickets, or ordered tickets online, to go to Kung Fu Movie Night at the Hollywood Theater here in Portland. Well, I'm in the Portland area, but anyway, it, it's in Portland, in the Hollywood District, named after the theater. So, what this is, is basically, one of the people who work at the Hollywood Theater, the programming director, whose name I have conveniently written down. One Dan Holstead. He is a film collector. In particular, he collects, among other things, kung fu films. And he is putting on a double feature. Um, they, they do a single film, like, every month around the third Tuesday of the month. This week they're doing a double feature, which is different from usual. Uh, putting on a double feature this week of the classic kung fu film Snake in the Eagle's Shadow starring Jackie Chan and directed by uh, Yen Wo Ping Yen Wu Ping, sorry and the other film is one which you likely never have heard of and it's your real kung fu movie buff Sabretooth Dragon vs. The Fiery Tiger so before I get started talking about the movies talk about the theater really quick the Hollywood Theater is, in brief, a movie house. It is not, you know, your standard independent movie theater, relatively small, nor is it a multiplex. It is a movie house. The red, It's got the red curtains. It's got the Art Deco decor. It has little faux balconies on either side of the... Um, big screening room. There, there are like three small th three theaters in there, three screening rooms. There's the main theater, which it has a stage. It's not just, oh, there's the the there's your projection screen. There's a stage. You people walk up on it. Um, Dan inter did an introduction for each movie. He came up on the stage with a microphone and gave an introduction. And most, if you think about it, most movie theaters, most multiplexes, your Regals, your Cinema 21s, whatever, it's a screen on a wall. It is a theater, it, it is, put it this different way. The Hollywood Theater is kind of a theater with an RE, as well as a theater with an ER. And it makes sense from this. Um, when the theater opened, it was in the 1920s, early 1920s, it was pre-talkies. A lot of the movies being shown there were silent films, and so you would not just be accommodating your audience and the projection equipment and the screen, you would also have a seven-piece orchestra um, providing musical accompaniment to the films. Um, if you've seen silent films before, particularly stuff of the... Um, not like Metropolis, because Metropolis oftentimes has more elaborate new scores, but like Gordio Moroder, that sort of thing. But if you get to like your um, Nosferatu or your Cabinet of Dr. Caligari or that sort of thing, stuff which is, I mean, it's classics of silent film, but, or, or Chaplin, Chaplin in particular, rather, rather classics of silent film, but they are also films which are which don't get the special treatment that, like, Metropolis gets, um, it really makes a difference in terms of the, um, composition. And in terms of, of, like, what the music sounds like. Because this would be live music with the theater. But anyway, I'm getting on a bit, rambling a bit here. 
Double theater. It, it is a wonderful theater. It, it's recently had new seats installed. Um, it was a big fundraising project to get basically purchase the seats from Regal Cinemas. And my dog is barking. Um, and actually, currently, they are doing a fundraiser right now to put in a new sign and marquee in front of the theater, like the one that would have been with the original theater. Excuse me, I want to take a drink. So, the, so I'm going to put a link in the show notes to the Hollywood Theater's webpage. I encourage you to make donations. This is a great theater. If you live in Portland, I mean... Part of the town is named after the theater. It's the, like the only part of town which is named after a building. Not a street, not a person in Portland's history, a building. This theater is very much a part of Portland's historic heritage and needs to be restored. If you are a film buff, and this is an art house theater. This is like the dictionary definition of art house theater because it's run by a non-profit. All of the movies being shown here are either like second or third run or independent films in some cases second or third run independent films or new prints of classic movies like recently they had Raiders of the Lost Ark in a new third in a new print and they're going to be doing later this month Temple of Doom um probably Last Crusade later on I'm probably going to go see that in, um at the Hollywood Theater um and also local independent film projects and that sort of thing. I mean, we have special events at this. They have special events at this theater. They have a thing called um, Heckle Vision, where they show a really bad movie, like a Steven Seagal film, or the one they have coming up is Showgirls. And what you do is you text in to a specific number or whatever, and they display your heckle text at the bottom of the screen. It encourages you to have your cell phone on while you're watching the movie to send the text up. As opposed to just shouting them at the screen because then you get drowned out in the noise. Um, so, and all sorts of other great stuff. Like, there's a um, the example of other things that are coming up that they had ads for, which looks kind of cool. They have a festival of grindhouse film trailers. Um, not not the films themselves, but like trailers, which are, I mean, I've seen a bunch of them, and some of those can be really nuts and kind of funny in, in interesting ways. Um, and kind of cool. I I understand kind of where the stylistic stuff from the fake trailer segment of the Grindhouse movie came from. It's If you think, oh, it's a pastiche, they're just overdoing it. No, 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 no. I mean, the way that they're overdoing it in the sense of that they're doing stunts that couldn't work in the original film because in the original movie is because it requires you to be spending more than a ham sandwich on the film. Whereas, but they would still be shooting for things like, oh, um, Nazi, oh, um, Werewolf Women of the SS. They would probably do that. They, um, they would probably even find a way to have some white guy as Fu Manchu. Not Nicolas Cage, because... I mean, not, not, not because he didn't wasn't acting at the time, but because... Well, no, they're not an actor of Nicolas Cage's stature. No, they would have gotten an actor of Nicolas Cage's stature in terms of an actor who has name recognition, but who needs to get paid because he owes money to the IRS or other things. In the case, it would probably be like a... Ooh, like, um... Like one of the older Barrymore's... Um, or an, uh, an actor of some name recognition was part of a family of actors. Um, if Martin Sheen was desperately looking for work and in money problems, Martin Sheen or Donald Sutherland or that sort of thing. It'd be, but yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. This is an awesome theater. It deserves your support. And if you are coming to Portland for vacation or whatever, stop on. Stop on by. Um, again, putting the link to their webpage in the show notes. Check to see what they're showing, and you know, maybe go catch a movie. You'll be glad you did. It's affordable. This, the tickets for me cost seven bucks. That is significantly less than it would cost if I went to, oh, any big name theater: Regal, Cinema, um, Century, anything. So. 
let's talk about the movies now. Go in order of screening. Snake in the Eagle's Shadow. Again, directed by Yan Wu Ping. It's first film he directed. His first collaboration with Jackie Chan. And this is the film which kind of really made Jackie Chan into a big name. This in of itself, just saying that, should be enough to get you to go, okay, this is a good movie, I need to see it. But there's more to it than that. It's... I mean, it, it's one of Jackie... It's a period piece, among other things. It's set in, like, the 1850s. We have... Um, we got your... Um, one of the characters is a Westerner. Uh, he's played by Kung Fu Jesus, is the nickname he's been given, and he, it fits him perfectly. The actor's name is... Sorry about this. I did my research. Really, I swear. Um, Roy Horan. Or Ray Horan. Um, he's very good. He has um, a sword versus kung fu fight scene with Jackie Chan later in the movie. Fencing versus kung fu. It's a well done fight scene. I actually was really good. I'm impressed. Also in the film is... Uh, Chan Lung, who plays the substitute teacher at the school while Jackie Chan's character is in. This is actually one of the films where Jackie Chan is very much... He's an everyman, but he's a put-upon everyman. He's at this kung fu school. He is an orphan. He's raised there, but he's basically treated like the school's punching bag by a substitute instructor. Chan Lung. Um, it's a very zero-to-hero story. Um, Chan's character named Qian Fu is a, basically he is sort of sort of saves this beggar I say sort of because the beggar is quite capable of taking care of himself um named uh, Pai Sheng Tian Pai Sheng Tian who is the grandmaster of the snake fist style of Kung Fu his school is basically almost wiped and wiped out by the eagle's claw Society and their style of kung fu, uh, with the grandmaster who's played by Xu Tianwen, who was uh, being the last one left. The snake, the um, eagle's claw style, is led by Lord Sheng Quan, who's played by, I believe he's a Korean actor from his name, Huang Yang Yi, Zhang Yi. Sorry, uh, Huang Zhang Li. I apologize for mangling these names. Straight up, first thing. I want to apologize for mangling these names. Um, and you see, all these actors are good at actors and at martial arts and physical stuff. In particular, Chan, uh, Chan Lung, um, he, kind of, he actually, he's kind of a hidden highlight in this movie. He's basically playing a character who has to be deliberately bad at Kung Fu. Not just like, oh, he's not just like, okay, we can hire any actor, it doesn't matter if he's good at Kung Fu or not. He has to show that, have the gravitas of someone who thinks he's good, and the attitude and posture of someone who thinks he's good, but when the chips are down, we need to be clear and convincing that he is, in fact, not very good at all. He can make mistakes, clear openings, all that sort of thing. But he also has to be able to do physical comedy. There's a bit where after Jackie Chan's character, uh, Chian, has gotten some... He's got, he's got some snake fist under his belt. Um, where he's being for, told, he's cleaning the floor, and the apprent and the uh, instructor, up to instructor, uh, is basically going, alright, I'm going to put you in your place. And he steps in some dust and goes to walk on the floor to make uh, Chan clean up in his um, clean up his footprints on the floor. And the way the scene works, you have to see this. And describing it is in and of itself cool. And yes, you could theoretically call it a spoiler, but not really, because it's a spoiler if I show it to you. Telling you what exists doesn't quite doesn't do enough to make it clear how cool this is. One of the nice things about kung fu films is if I'm doing a talking head review like this, it even if I tell you everything, it doesn't spoil anything. Because what you're going for is to see, well, the kung fu. Anyway, I'm digressing. The um, the instructor has got the powder on his feet. And he's walking on the floor trying to leave footprints, 
And so Jackie Chan's character, what he does is he takes his wet rags and slides and slides them under his under the instructor's feet. And so and so the way the stunt works is the instructor kind of slipping a little bit and has to do with all the footwork stuff. And this is clear, this is something that is not easy. Looking at this like this is a hard thing to sequence a bit to pull off. And with someone who actually wasn't a really good martial artist in real life, or someone who was uh, or a background in dance or something like that, something with a lot of leg muscle control, um, you'd probably end, the actor would probably end up hurting themselves. They would end up slipping and falling, landing on their butt, or pulling a muscle or something like that. But uh, Chia, Chan Lung, Chan Lung does it excellent job with this scene. He really sells it, and he looks great through all of this. It's excellent. This movie is out on DVD, as opposed to the other film I'll be talking about, which means that you should buy this. It is sadly not a Dragon Dynasty release, which which makes me sad. It makes me sad right here that this is not a Dragon Dynasty release. Heck, neither of these films are. Uh, Dragon Dynasty, for those who don't know, if you're out in the know, if you don't know who they are, you need to. They are the Criterion Collection of Kung Fu films. Yes, Janus Films, um, who owns Criterion Collection, has done some Kung Fu releases in their past. I believe a bunch of Bruce Lee's films got a release on VHS by them at some point. In particular, I remember watching Fist of Fury, aka the Chinese Connection, on... Um, VHS, and I want to say that was a Dragon Dynasty release. Anyway, oh, all these dubbed, by the way, it's, it's your Hong Kong dub and your Hong Kong sound effects where a punch sounds like a wrestling cloth right next to the microphone, but so much so it blows it out. Let's see if we can try and simulate it in a second. Be right back. So... Sort of like this. They're not quite like that. I'm probably not blowing out the mouth, mouth ah, the mic enough to really get that across. But that's kind of what it sounds like if you've never seen a kung fu film before. And if you haven't, why haven't you? You can get a collection of like 10 or 50 or 25 kung fu films on a nice tin DVD set for at most grocery store, grocery stores, video stores, bookstores online stores, possibly even your thrift stores for like five to ten bucks. But I am. But it, it, it's, a, it's a thing in the sense that it is a very specific style of doing your sound effects which makes everything have real weight. It's, on the one hand, it's unrealistic and it has a certain degree of hokiness but this hokiness has charm. This hokiness really gives... It, it, it makes everything seem larger than life. And I bring this up because we have the uh, Riz's Kung Fu film that's coming out soon. And I hope that when he makes this... that If you're in post-production right now, Riza, you haven't done your Foley yet, and you're listening to this, do remember that in Kung Fu films, when you're doing a pastiche or, an, or, homage, or paying homage to the classic Shaw Brothers and all this other stuff, like Snake and the Eagle Shadow, the sound effects count for a lot. Just saying. So, is that. Um, and, yeah, that's a good movie. Kung Fu Jesus. You mentioned Kung Fu Jesus. Yeah, everyone is good. Everyone is good in this movie. You need to go see it. Other film. Other film is... Sabretooth Dragon vs. Fiery Tiger. This film is weird. This is a wuxia film. If you're not familiar with the genre, that's like your Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon stuff, but this is the earlier thing. This is Shaw Brothers era, so we don't have the budget for the level of impressive wire work or location shooting that the original had. Usually it's like, for most older Awuja films, location shooting can be 
if they do location shooting at all, you can summarize it as, we drove up into the mountains of Hong Kong or Taiwan for some of the undeveloped, for some undeveloped land for, oh, 10 minutes, 10 minute, 15 minute drive, maybe, yeah, in that range, maybe less. We found some scenery, and we we found some places which we couldn't see any major modern stuff, and we used it. Plus, they usually had some like backlot sets and stuff built, which they were used a bunch. Um, and these films, they tend to have more swordplay stuff to them. They tend to have more. Um, those tend to be more melodramatic. I mean, kung fu films are all melodramatic anyway. But these are like because because they're all to be based on books and put this right the wuxia genre in China and Hong Kong and Taiwan kind of is to West it kind of is for their literature and not to be myth but their as far as the societal baggage it has to it what Wagner and Mallory and Howard Pyle and all of the Arthurian Arthurian medieval knight fiction is and, and fantasy in that vein is to um, our, our culture in terms of it, it all builds off, builds off a kind of idealized picture of history um, knights in the middle ages were never as civilized let's say civilized but as for lack of a better term, um, benevolent or as elegant or as truly a chivalric necessarily as Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table were. They are those guys were the ideal. Our diamond was like that, and with the kung fu films, everything's kind of building off of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms book. Not not the events, historical events, but the book, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which has very little to do with, which not sorry, has very little. Events are the same, but it's a much more, it's romanticized, it's dramatized, it's played up for heavier drama and melodrama than the actual historical events of the Three Kingdoms period. Or the book Outlaws of the Marsh, formerly known as Outlaws of the Water Margin. Um, and all that sorts of stuff, and other authors have built off of that, and many of their books got turned into kung fu films. Probably some classic examples of this being, um, oh, the Condor Heroes series and uh, Sword Stained with Royal Blood and that sort of thing. Some of these have turned into movies, some of these have turned into TV series. I may give one of these TV series at some point the sci fi debris review by review, uh, episode by episode review treatment. But let's talk about this one. This movie. It's hard to find. Um, this is like the first time the guy who does this, uh, Dan, found a print of this. And I did some checking online about it before I went to see it in the theater. And this has been out on VHS or something every now and then, but it's never been in the best condition. Um, oftentimes, basically, whoever this film stock is, whoever's had this, or, whoever, or whenever people have had this film stock, apparently no one ever until they got into the hands of people who give a damn about kung fu films it's never been treated very well so when the people who care get it they get films which is prints which are scratched or in some cases have decayed to the point where you have to basically splice this film enough that it it kinda suffers it's not to be fair with this print you can still follow the story very very well uh, it's just characters will pop in and out of this very quickly and I suspect there's a certain degree of character development which I think got lost not because the directors and the editors were incompetent but because those chunks of the film kind of died which is sad the film itself the plot it's um, it's kind of like a weird evil version of Henry uh, 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 like the Henry IV and Henry V thing where the fourth son of the Manchu Emperor 
is part of the Wu Lin, which if you know Wuxia, this is sort of like your knights errant who go around the country either writing wrongs or doing, doing kung fu or that sort of thing. And the, his circle of friends are all Han. And they're considered second class citizen Han and other non Han and general Chinese. And they're considered second class citizens under the Manchu. Um, I've actually been reading a book recently about Chinese history. Um, it's by Julie Lowell. It's called The Great Wall. So bring the, I know, I'll grab the book and bring it over. Find it. Don't have it with me at the moment. That's okay. Sorry for the lack of professionalism there. Um, I'll put the title in the show notes. It's an interesting book. If you're watch, if you're going to watch kung fu films for some Bucky Wuxia films for something other than the just this fight scene element of this, if you want to get more into the story, taking a moment to learn a bit about Chinese history helps. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there where they expect you to have some knowledge of Chinese history in the film because they're made for Chinese audiences to get something out of this in the same way that for most like if you're Arthur, Arthurian fil- legends or, or the Arthurian films or your medieval films like um, Name of the Rose or that sort of thing or the uh, Brother Cadfield TV series they expect you to have a, some general ideas about how medieval society worked you may not have 100% knowledge of how everything really happened in terms of all the historical texts and stuff and all the research that's been done, but you have a general idea of, okay, king, knights, um, feudal lords, feudal loyalty, that sort of thing. In the same way that the that Wuxia requires, do you know a little bit about Confucianism? You might not be able to quote Confucius, but you don't need to be able to quote Confucius, but you need to know how the lamp the layers of filial piety and filial loyalty work um and all this sorts of stuff and anyway so the third prince basically the fourth prince when the emperor dies is chosen to become the new emperor and he quickly turns full on evil scenery chewing maniacal laugh maniacally laughing evil um and so the emperor's former friends must now band together to overthrow him and kill him for the good of all China. And that sort of thing. And again, this one was kind of nuts. As an example, when our group of kung fu heroes, uh, uh, the members of the Wu Lin, banded together to overthrow the emperor, the emperor realizes, you know, all things considered, having some kung fu bodyguards would be good right now. So he recruits the Dalai Lama, along with his force of kung fu enforcers, all welding flying guillotines. With also a Mongolian guy who I don't know if he's supposed to be Genghis Khan. But he's a Mongolian guy. We didn't hear his name. We were too busy laughing in the theater at the Dal- at the Kung Fu Dalai Lama. And I'm not kidding. Like, oh, he meant to look like the Dalai Lama. They call him the Dalai Lama in the dub. The um, or other examples. The emperor when he is doing his thing with the concubine. Um, he has a guy, he has a soldier whose basically job it is to sit out of sight of what of what's going on, but with an earshot to remind the emperor not to overdo it, which is leads to a great deal of, of unintentional comedy in this film. And then there's the whole matter of, I'll leave this to your imagination, in case you get a chance, do get a chance to see this movie, and you should. You should take that chance if you do. If an opportunity comes, the cylinder of death. I'll just leave it at that. The cylinder of death. Let your imagination do the work. Other than that, the kung fu scene fight scenes are excellent. Um, there are some bits which seem kind of iffy. I don't. I don't know if this is bits where 
the or the actor in question who was cast for this role that were cast for acting ability and not ability to kung fu, and they didn't have the right fight choreographer. But the actors here who do know martial arts do a good job at it. There's a good there's a good um, uh, monk Taoist priest with staff with little chimes on it versus um, uh, war fan fight scene early on. Um, there's moments of the later fight scene which are pretty good. Um, the there, there's some good spear fighting as well. It's, it's the good it's good martial arts, good wushu film. It's the few characters where they're good at acting but not good in martial arts, but they're put in martial arts roles where things get iffy. Um, the writing, it's hard to tell how good it is. The bits of writing that we get for dialogue and overall narrative structure, those work. It is a it. Um, it's just because of the condition of the film, I can't judge the narrative that well. Um, as well as well as I like, I want. Here's what I want. This film looks like it is. If I were to see the whole thing, with a good print, where everything's there, I would find this film to be amazing. So here, I'll tell you what. Both of these films need to be in the Dragon Dynasty. You need to get Dragon Dynasty releases. And if... Here's my open thing. I have no money to put where my mouth is here. I'm just putting this out there. Dragon Dynasty, people. Miramax. Please do everything in your power to find a print of this somewhere, anywhere in Hong Kong that is in good condition. I don't care if it doesn't have the dub, the Hong Kong dub. If you can find in some vault a good condition print of this film, I don't know who has it, I don't know where it is, just find it, remaster it, put it out on DVD or Blu-ray. Subtitle, of course. It's a, yeah, hell, if you want to do a new, Hong, new pseudo Hong Kong dub, that's fine too, but just put it out. I will watch this. I will buy this. I will bump this to the top of my buy list. I will push this back the God, past the Godfather. I'll push this back Das Boot. Push it past Das Boot. I will push this past if we get... Um, I'll push this past Extended Edition of The Hobbit. I will push this past... If we get the original unedited version of the Star Wars trilogy on Blu-ray remastered Han shoots first. If Sabretooth Dragon and Fire versus Fiery Tiger comes out on Blu-ray and I have to choose between the two, I will pick Sabretooth Dragon. Cuz I I've seen unedited Star Wars. I know I'm getting there. But there is stuff missing here that I would like to see. There's probably some chunks of fight scenes here that are missing that I would like to see. This looks like a film where I would really enjoy the whole thing. If I got if I had a chance to see the whole thing, it would be fun, it'd be great. It's something to do with a bunch of friends. So I fully recommend both of these films, in case you didn't figure that out. And also, if you have a local independent theater um, who does a Kung Fu night, go see this movie, go see Kung Fu movies with people. It sounds silly, but seeing, but seeing these movies with a lot of people was an excellent experience. And something which isn't replaced by watching this in the home, or even with a like, small number of friends. Because it's great seeing the people, and when something really absurd happens, laughing. When something unintentionally hilarious happens, laughing, or going, ooh, when a really cool stunt or fight scene bit is done. This is something to be you really should take advantage of if there's somebody near you who's doing this. Whether you're in Portland or Seattle or San Francisco or Boston or Detroit or anywhere, if your city is doing a kung fu movie night, go see these movies. See these movies as they really were meant to be seen on the big screen, on film with people. Because odds are, when you went, to, probably when you went to see these movies when they were first screened in the U.S. in the first place, you'd be getting an audience like this, who would be giving reactions like this. So, 
take advantage of this, will you? And hopefully, you know, if you see me at one of these Kung Fu nights, say hi. Um, and hopefully, I'll, yeah, I look forward to seeing some of you there if you're in the Portland area. Or if I'm in another place where it's just doing one of these for a convention or something like that, maybe I'll see you there as well. But, that's that. Next time, we may have Rendezvous with Rama. We may have something else. We shall see. So until then, I'm Count Zero. Thanks for watching.